Okay, so that's pretty much uh, what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to look at these perceptrons, which are just another word for these neural networks. And um, they're feed-forward architectures in the sense that they take an input and they produce an output. Um, so it's, it's sort of one directional. Um, unlike other architectures that exist out there that are recurrent, where the output feeds back to the input. Um, I'm going to mention something about recurrent architectures late, um, later in the course. And um, what we'll see here is that the ideas that we've been using for learning, the idea that you can learn by minimizing a cost function, or that you can learn by maximizing the likelihood, or a regularized uh, cost function, which is equivalent to a likelihood times a prior, um, still apply. And, if, and there will be free parameters. And to choose those free parameters, you do cross-validation or put strapping. And if there are too many free parameters, then you would use a technique like Bayesian optimization <coughs> on top to optimize um, these techniques. So everything we've learned applies in this domain. And when we have continuous data, we will use Gaussian models. When we have discrete binary data, we will use Bernoulli models. And then when we have more than one category, we will use uh, multinomial probability distributions um, to model the likelihood. So to each different kind of data, there is one type of distribution. We take the negative log likelihood, and that gives us the cost function that we need to optimize. And then optimization is just a question of computing the derivative and once you have the derivative, you just do the gradient descent. Or if you can compute the second derivative, and there are not too many parameters, you can do a Hessian uh, method. And if you have too much data, then it makes sense to do it online. And that is to just take a few data points. So that's essentially the summary. We will do what we've done for every other model, for linear models, for logistic regression. The only thing that changes now is that the models will, will get a bit more complicated. OK, so let's go back to uh, logistic regression, which, as I um, said in the last class, is a neural network with one neuron. So you can think of the um, one basic unit here as this mccullough pitts model of a neuron. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so in this case, there's two inputs, um, x1 and x2, at time i, so at data point i. And there is one output, which is this prediction y hat. And if you were doing uh, binary classification, that output would be just the probability of y being equal to 1. And because, because recall that the sigmoid function will ensure that that output is between 0 and 1. So the, the, the sigmoid function squashes u so that it's between 0 and 1. OK, so what's the setup? Um, let's review it one more time. So to begin, we are given some data. And the data is for a supervised setting. So the data consists of pairs, x, y pairs. The y is a binary. And the x's, in this case, there's two inputs. But there could be more inputs. I've made my x's be continuous, but the x's could be continuous or categorical or um, because the, we're not modeling the axis, the axis are deterministic, so this wouldn't be a problem. If I plot the data, um, basically I plot x1 versus x2, um, then we'll see that each data point is a point in 2D, so these are the input coordinates, x1 and x2 of the point, and the color, whether it's red or green, it's essentially whether this y is 0 or 1. So if y is 0, um, the color is red. If y is 1, the color is green. Um, usually, our, the input problem is we're giving this cloud of points. Learning is the task of finding this blue separating surface, so, which is essentially a line. Or in 2D, it would be a plane. In higher D, it would be a hyperplane. And that separating surface, that separating plane, um, is often called a discriminant function because it discriminates one class from the other. Okay, so, so this is the input to us. 
And that's what we're after. We're after learning the line. And learning the line is equivalent to learning the parameters. If you know the parameters, you know how to draw the line. OK, so um, let's review the math we did last week, sorry, uh, last Tuesday. So again, the idea here is that we, um, a single neuron takes the inputs, we, the bias term and the two actual signal inputs. It weights them by theta. So in this case, for example, xi2 gets weighted by theta3. It adds them all up and that gives us the signal u. So as you can see here, u is a linear combination of theta1 times 1 plus theta2 times xi1 plus theta3 times xi2. And then what you do then is you put this u signal through a sigmoid, which is um, this function here, 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 1. And then if you squash it, um, you get something that's between 0 and 1. And so we interpret that as the probability of y being equal to 1. In other words, the binary probability, the probability of y given the input and the parameters, is this Bernoulli distribution. And the Bernoulli distribution has success yi halves. So that's the probability of y i being equal to 1. And then failure rate uh, 1 minus y, yi hat, which is the probability of yi being 0. And if we expand it, then you can see that if yi was 1, then this term survives. And if you, uh, whereas this term would be 1 minus 1, 0, so this whole thing would be 1. In other words, when yi is equal to 1, this expression simplifies to yi. And when yi is 0, this whole expression simplifies to 1 minus yi hat. Okay? So this single expression is basically summarizing that the probability of yi being 1, given the input, is just yi hat. And the probability of yi being 0, given the input, is just 1 minus yi hat. And this is a well-defined model because only two things can happen. The output is either 0 or 1. In other words, the neuron fires or the neuron doesn't fire. So it's a gate. It's a binary gate. Um, and if you add these two, you get one. So we have a valid probabilistic model. If you now have n training data, uh, we assume that the data is independent. It's not always the case, but for most situations, we'll assume that the data is independent. Um, and if the data is independent, then we just model it. Um, the product of all the data is just the product of the individual likelihoods. So the joint likelihood of the data is just the product of the individual likelihoods. Very much like we did in linear regression. Linear regression, each data point was Gaussian, and then we multiplied all those Gaussians for each of these data points, and that gave us a multivariate Gaussian, which was the distribution over all the observations, y. Okay. Now, so that's a single neuron. Um, the separating, as, and as picture illustrates, we went over this um, in some pictures in the last class. With a single neuron, you can only make linear separating surfaces. Okay, so the, the, the boundary, the boundary is essentially the equation of a line, which is given by this, by the U signal. And so the problem with this is that um, this led to a lot of controversy back in the 50s because um, the idea was that a neural net, a neuron like this was meant to be thought as a gate. And um, just like a gate in semiconductors where you get AND gates and OR gates and AND gates and so on. Um, the difficulty was this. Which gate does this, uh, which gate gives you this? In other words, XOR, the XOR gate. XOR gate basically says that when the two inputs are different, then it fires. Um, it, it won't fire for them being uh, the same. So the problem with this is that 
if you want to create a gate that does this with a single neuron, um, it's impossible because there's no way to make sure that you can group these two guys and the uh, two blue guys separately. So a neuron cannot model this. Right, simply because if you use a separating plane, then uh, here you would have an element for which the XOR gate fires one and an element where the XOR gate fires zero. And likewise here. If you use this other plane, it wouldn't work. This plane wouldn't work. Anyway, you can draw every plane you might want to. None of these planes will give you what you want. So, so the worry was that um, you, can't cop, you can't generate XOR gate with a neuron. And if you can't create something as simple as XOR gate, then maybe um, there's no point to do any more research in neural networks. And as silly as that argument might seem, um, books were written on the topic and the field kind of died for a bit. <clears throat> then came the comeback answer. The comeback answer was introduce a more sophisticated neural network. In particular, make sure that there is a hit, what neural net scientists call a hidden layer. Okay, so there's usually in the lingo of neural networks, the, the inputs are the input layer. So you can think of the inputs as, um, I don't know, photoreceptors in the eye. And then you go through a first layer in V1, say at the back of your head, and then you go to a second layer of processing before you can produce the output. The data is still the same, so nothing's changed. It's still the same problem, but we've made the model more complex. By making the model more complex, um, the idea is we will build gates that will be nonlinear. And if they're nonlinear, they will allow us to do separating surfaces that look like this. And so it becomes possible to do XOR gate. So it becomes possible to put the two crosses in one class and the two zeros in another class. Um, questions that arise, um, and we'll soon see how this works precisely. Um, but the questions that start arising when you do this is how many neurons <coughs> should you put in each layer? How many layers should you have? And these are sort of the sort of things for which you will have to cross-validate and take computation into consideration and the sort of thing for which Bayesian optimization could do a good job. Now, once you have that and you have some data, um, by having separate nonlinear surfaces, now we go back to the problem that we had when dealing with RBFs, because this essentially is very similar to an RBF. You might have a separating boundary that is smooth, like this blue curve, or you might have one that is very wiggly, like the purple curve. Okay. Which one is better, by the way? Hmm? The smooth one. The world tends to be smooth. We tend to prefer things like the blue one. And the more neurons you add, the more flexible the model is. So re recall that I showed you before these plots where if you have a very flexible model, um, it will, at least in the regression case, like a higher order polynomial would be a lot more wobbly. It would have a lot more variation. So controlling the number of neurons is a way of controlling complexity of the model. Okay, how does this work? Let's analyze it step by step. Um, the, the nice idea, uh, the nice thing about neural networks is you can analyze them with a picture, with a graph, or you can analyze them um, by writing the equations. So, um, so they're very easy to visualize, in other words. Um, how does this work? So we have the two inputs, x1 and x2. Each of these inputs gets weighted by a, a weight, theta 2 and theta 3. And then they get summed, and that produces u11. So u11 is for layer 1, the, 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 the sort of intermediate signal inside the neuron. And if you look at the equation of u11 here, you'll see that u11 is just um, theta 1 times 1 plus theta 2 weighted 
sorry, x1 weighted by theta 2 and then x2 gets weighted by theta 3. So each data point uh, x1 and x2 would be weighted by these in order to produce u11. Then u11 goes through a sigmoid in order to produce the output in layer 1 for neuron 1. So the two indices here would be layer 1, neuron 1. And the reason why I'm putting these indices is because when you implement this, if you're careful monitoring these indices, this whole operation here can be um, vectorized. So the sum, this is, well, is obviously just a matrix vector multiplication for all the data. And then this is just pointwise evaluation. You evaluate each entry of the vector. And so you can actually, this type of operations that I'm doing now, it's in, in code, it's very, sh you know, it's very easy to code it. It's very simple. It's just a few matrix vector operations. A couple of lines. And we do the same from the bottom neuron. We follow the signal. So we have um, theta 4 times 1. And then we have theta 9 times theta 9 times x1. <coughs> and then theta 8 times x2. We also put that signal through a sigmoid to give us the output in layer 1 for neuron 2 which is given by this squashed output. And then the squashed output gets multiplied by theta 7 and theta 6 for the top neuron. And again, we have a bias term for the output. Um, that gives us the intermediate signal in the second layer for the one neuron that's there, which is basically theta 5 plus theta 6 times 011 plus theta 7 times 012. And then I squash it in order to give me the prediction. The y's are the data, so it's still as before. The y's are binary, so we still use a, the same likelihood as for logistic regression. So in terms of probabilistic modeling, nothing changed. Everything is the same. It's still a Bernoulli model, and you still will learn it the same way. You take the negative log, it will give you the cross entropy, and then we just compute the derivative and optimize of the derivative. Oh, speaking of which, I just realized I didn't make the homework uh, on the website available this morning. Um, it will be there later today. Uh, so, in a few minutes. Go ahead. Is there a reason why there's two ones in the input layer? So, the, the reason why there's two, two ones in the input layer? Two ones in the input layer. Um, could you get away with just doing one? Probably. Let me think. Um, yes, that's correct. There's no need for two ones there. I could just have a one feeding into signals. So I was drawing this and painfully PowerPoint and put an extra one there. Okay. Yeah. So generally, you have to round the outputs of the sigmoid functions, right? Yeah. Um, do you want to round before or after you put them into the second layer? Um, you might want to round them before, and it'll, it'll soon be clear. So the next slide will make that clear. The reason why you want to round them before is because you want you want to sum nonlinear units. It will be very clear soon. So the uh, purpose of those sigmoid functions is to introduce nonlinearity into the uh, process. That is correct. That is the exact answer. And let me show you how that comes to be. OK, before, actually, I did have those. Uh, hang on, let me just, yeah, OK. Let me maybe go a bit ahead of myself here in the lecture to be able to answer your questions. Um, so now think of a different setting, regression. So in regression, the output is continuous. And just to answer, I'll come back to this, but just to answer your question, um, the output 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 is essentially a sigmoid function, right? And so 0, 1, 2 is also a sigmoid function as a function of the input. So you can think of 0, 1, 1 as something like this blue curve. It's a sigmoid. And you can think of 0, 1, 2 as another curve, say, this um, red curve here, reddish brown. Now, the nice thing is if my data looks like this, 
like a step up and down, then by just having two of these bricks, I can add them up and I can generate this regression function. So by having nonlinearity, what I've done is I've created a nice brick. And if I have a brick, I'll soon argue that this is a brick that I can make fat or tall or wide. And because I can change the shape of this brick and I can sort of flip, it, flip the sign of the brick, I can build any function. In approximation theory, there's actually a result that says that a one-layer neural network is able to approximate any smooth function arbitrarily well as the number of units goes to infinity. So that's kind of getting ahead. But let's go back to, so I'll come back to it, but let's um, stick with our uh, extension of logistic regression first. So we have a logistic model. So each likelihood for each data point is um, the logistic function. If you have more points, if you now have a whole uh, data set with n independent observations of input, output, and pairs, then we just take the product from 1 to n of the individual likelihoods. Now if you take the product and you want to get the cost function, we do exactly what we did for logistic regression. We just take the negative log likelihood. So in other words, minus log of a product is just the sum of the log and then the log of some quantity to a power is just the power times the log of that quantity. So if you take the log of this expression here, that just gives you this error function, which is uh, what we uh, discussed last in the last class is the cross entropy. And the cross entropy is a measure of uncertainty in the system. So by minimizing the cross entropy, we're maximizing our information about the date. So the model is learning, in other words. So this is binary classification and there's binary classification is sort of a popular thing in neural networks because you're still thinking of zero, one gates and then you try to build all sorts of cool networks with it. Um, so here are some typical networks that you encounter in practice. This is sort of the old school networks before the deep learning. Uh, one network might be taking as input age, sex, income, occupation, education, your social class, your geographic location, and then that network predicts whether you're a customer or not a customer. In fact, for many people, um, have, have any of you played an IQ test in Facebook? No? You're actually smart. You have a higher IQ than um, I would be tempted, uh, although I wouldn't want my kid to be real. But here's the thing. Those making you play that game, they're actually recording your IQ. And they're collecting data about you, your age, your sex, who your friends are, the age and sex of your friends. So, so they're collecting a huge feature vector and they have your IQ. If they have your IQ and a huge feature vector, what can they do? Predict out those IQ. Exactly. You can predict the IQ of any of you and me. Um, so that's, data is very powerful. You can do all sorts of things with data. Um, and uh, a paper on this will be coming out, hopefully, after this video is uh, uh, published. Uh, not too long after this video is published, I mean to say. Um, so, the, so there's sort of very interesting things you can do with data. Um, in this case, the application is just to um, construct a model to predict whether you're going to be a customer or not. Um, neural networks are actually used a lot in a very big application of machine learning, which is credit rates. Uh, in other words, when you use your credit card, machines automatically very quickly know whether you're credit worthy or not. Uh, if you had a human in the loop, it would take a, you know, you would use your card and you would have to wait a few hours before you get a reply. Um, and that, that was in the old days. Nowadays, everything is done quickly. So credit scoring is, um, 
um, has been made possible thanks to machine learning. Um, it's not a solved problem. There are countries like Nigeria, India, Uganda, and so on, where credit scoring actually works very poorly. And the reason being that, um, unlike us here in, in the very nice country where it's very easy to classify people according to income, um, if you if you work live in Uganda, you're probably making less than 50 bucks a month, and um, there's no notion of a formal job and so on. So it's it's very hard to actually be able to um, do credit scoring, and this is a huge problem in an area called. Uh, oh, I forget what it's called. Microloans. Microloans, microfinance, because you want to help people by doing this microfinance and doing microloans, but you also want to know how reliable are people, how likely is it that they will pay back those 50 bucks that you've lent them to change their lives. Um, here's another sort of uh, application from a uh, professor from Stanford. Uh, I forget his name. Um, I have this cognitive disorder that I, forget, I always forget names. Um, um, so what he does is he takes two kinds of inputs. Um, uh, first he takes things, nouns basically, objects like uh, oaks or roses or can, uh, sunfish and so on. Um, and then the other type of input is a relation, like a verb like, or a containment relation like is, a, uh, or can, or has. And so for example, um, if he goes with a canary as the input, so a little yellow bird, and if, he, if the input here is one for can and zero for all the other ones, then the neural network does its magic and it predicts that the canary can grow, move, and fly, and sing. Okay, so if you have enough data, this is easy to train, this would be easy to train in Wikipedia, because in Wikipedia you can actually extract all the pairs of data that say canary can fly and so on, and then you will use that data to uh, train a network like this. And of, of course, a lot of that data will be missing stuff. Because maybe in Wikipedia, there's no single entry that says that, uh, that a canary can sing. Um, but if a canary shares the same features as um, a robin or so, then it might predict that the canary can also sing. If robins sing. I know the robins in England do. The one, the American ones, I don't know. Um, it's also possible to arrange these neural networks in different topologies. And so a common thing that we will see more throughout the course is to organize them in a grid, in a 2D setting. And this is sort of good for images, because basically the neural net, like the neural net my, it looks at a million or so places, and then it, it propagates them in parallel. So in layers like that. And that might be connections between the neurons on each layer, and then there's connections between the layers. So this is a very common model for computer vision. OK. So now let's come back to the slide, which is um, for regression. So neural nets can also be used for regression, where we're trying to predict an output, which is a continuous variable. Uh, minus 1.2 or 0 0.6 and so on. So everything is pretty much the same, except that now the label, or in this case I only have one input, but you could have more inputs. In this case the label is a continuous number, so it's no longer binary. Because the label is a continuous number that could be higher than one or, or, or smaller than one, Instead of having a sigmoid neuron here, I'm going to use a linear neuron. Okay? And I have to because if I have a sigmoid neuron there, I would never be able to get an output that's equal to 5 because the sigmoid squashes everything to be between 0 and 1. So, but if I just have a, a, a linear neuron, which is essentially the identity, so a linear neuron just basically says that the output here is the same as the input. In other words, yi is equal to u to y. 
and the interpretation we will give this output in terms of probability will be the expectation of y given x and theta and we will soon see why in, in the following slide. Um, but putting the, this expectation aside for the time being, um, the kind of predict what we really are learning to do here is let's look at the signal model. The signal model says that y hat which is equal to u to 1 um, is equal to theta 5 times 1, so theta 5 times 1, that's the equation there, plus theta 6 times 0, 1, 1. theta 6 times 1, 0, 1, 1 is this cyan thing here, and that's basically because 0, 1, 1 is equal to theta 1 times 1 plus theta 2 times xi, all added and then squashed through a sigmoid. And then if I look at theta 7, same thing. Um, I take theta 4 times plus theta 3 times xi, and then I take 1 plus 1 over e to the minus that quantity, which is the sigmoid, and then I multiply it by theta 7. Okay, so now each of those is a weighted sigmoid. And now you can look at what each parameter does. So my function, that neural network can be interpreted in two ways. So you can either use the picture to look at it, or you can just use that equation. The equation describes the graph. The graph is a picture for the equation. The equation simply is like an RBF, right? It's basically saying the output is a linear combination of basis functions. The difference with the RBF is that in this case, we're going to optimize all the parameters. In the RBF, there was this issue that we had to do cross-validation for the, the width of the basis functions, and we had to decide how we were going to, where we were going to place the RBFs and so on. Um, in this case, we were, we're going to um, estimate all those parameters from data using gradient descent. Um, now, let's look at what each of these parameters does. Theta 5. What does theta 5 do to the function? Move it up and down. Uh, theta 6. Yeah, it sort of squashes. If theta 6 is large, the cyan curve goes, so you have a taller S. And if theta 6 is a tiny, it makes that S small. If theta 6 is negative, it actually flips it. Now, what does theta 1 do? Yeah, shifts it left and right. Okay, because if you have a function of x minus a, it's just shifted x by a. And then uh, theta 2, A few of you are indicative. Theta 2 will just squash it or make it fat. Okay? So basically, we, with those parameters, we have the control for each basis function to do this, to do this, to move it left and right, to move it up and down. If you can make your bricks fatter or taller, and you can move them anywhere, you can build cities and towns and so on. So that, that's the idea of a neural network. We use this basic building, uh, building blocks, which are the neurons, and with the neurons we build uh, very complex functions, uh, arbitrary complex functions. And that's all there is to it. There is no magic to it. We, all we're doing is we're approximating very complex functions. So um, learning in a neural network is just about learning a nonlinear function. And that nonlinear function could be the function that we have in reg oops, the functions that we have in regression when we're just trying to predict input output uh, when we're trying to fit a curve to the data, or in the case of classification would be the separating boundary between the two classes. All right, now let's look at why the expectation, and the reason why the expectation is the same as the linear model. This is exactly the same reasoning that we did for the linear model. In other words, 
we assume that each point xi is Gaussian distributed. So, the, so sorry, that for any point xi to be precise, the yi is Gaussian distributed. So we assume that we have Gaussian noise in the outputs. And if we have Gaussian, so this is the probability of y given x and theta. X and theta are given, so this is just a distribution of a y. And basically this purple height here indicates the probability of this point. So that height there is the probability of y given x sine theta. It's exactly what we did for the linear model when we were looking at these squares. Um, and so we can also write a Gaussian. So the, the probability of this single point is just equal to a univariate Gaussian distribution. And this is the data point and it has some variance which we will assume it's known for simplicity for now. Um, and then the unknown is this yi hat which is a function of parameters. And now if you look at this expression for the Gaussian you see that yi hat is just the mean of the Gaussian and that's why I'm saying it's the mean, it's the expected value. If we want to compute the cost we just take the log of this, the negative log and then that gives us the cost. And then there's a constant there but since the constant doesn't affect the location of, the, of the, the maximum we just ignore the constant. So it's the same as least squares. The cost function is the sum of squared errors. The only difference is that now my function y i hat, my prediction is a neural network, it's a nonlinear function. It's exactly least squares but instead of using a line now we're using an arbitrary function, which is a combination of sigmoids. Okay, so, and then of course, everything we learned for linear models applies. If you want to regularize it, if you don't want your functions to oscillate too much, uh, what can we do? And yeah, do, a, do an L2 penalty. Um, so the L2 penalty uh, for neural networks is actually called weight decay because essentially you're asking all the weights to be small and um, in the, the psychologists when they came up with it independently they thought of it as trying to make the neurons not fire all the time, trying to conserve energy. And, um, and then the other way to control complexity is via the number of neurons as I said before, or the number of layers. So you have a few ways to control complexity. And if you have a few ways to control complexity and it becomes, becomes hard to then uh, tune all these to, to cross-validation, you could use Gaussian processes uh, with Bayesian optimization on top to tune it. Um, here is, um, so that's pretty much it. That's a neural network for regression. When you implement um, the only thing that's left for us to do is to compute the gradient of this. Once we have an expression for the gradient, we just give it to any optimization toolbox and it will give us the answer. If you're doing classification with many classes, um, this is now does involve some new things, so let's look at examining. So we're going to use at um, a technique, a coding technique here and the coding technique is as follows. So in this case I'm trying to classify things into being one of three classes. So for example whether something is red, green or blue. Um, what we do for each class, so again the data is the same as before, we have, as the binary case, we have two inputs and we also have the labels. So we have two inputs and we have the labels which say whether it's class 1, class 2 or class 3. But then what we do with this um, encoding, one of, one of k encoding it's called, in this case one of three, is that if it's a class 2 we put a 1 on yi2 and we put a 0 in the other. If it's class 1 we put a 1 in yi1 and so on. So this is just a way of sort of rewriting the data. So instead of having a, a number here that is 2, 1 or 3, what we will have is this encoding, 1 of k encoding. 
What this allows us to do is we then create a ne neural network that looks like this one here on top, where each label, each YI, is going to be um, a linear combination essentially of the, the two neurons that we have here. And we'll soon, so the only thing that will be left is for us to write what is the probabilistic model that describes this network and then we're going to take the negative log and that's going to give us a cost function. Okay. Go ahead. Um, just having the sigmoid function at the end doesn't come from having zero and one, right? Pardon? The last layer where we don't have sigmoid function. Yeah. So you could have a sigmoid there, but as we, I will see in the next slide, you don't need it. It'll be clear in the next slide. Okay, and so the task in this case is to learn a separating boundary that looks like this purple one here, that separates the three classes. Okay, so how do we define the likelihood? The way we define the likelihood and this is why we don't need these guys to be squashed between 0 and 1, is we're going to say the probability of class 2, for example, that is class 0, 1, 0, is going to be equal to, and I'm going to introduce this function here. I'm arbitrarily introducing that function. Well, not entirely arbitrarily. I'm introducing that function because that function has some nice properties. Uh, property one, um, can that function be greater than one? No, because it's, um, there are only three possible outputs and you're dividing by uh, some. Can that function ever be negative? Okay, so that function actually is between zero and one and it's positive. So it will allow me to interpret it as a probability of class two. The reason why I didn't need a sigmoid output was because just by using this function, I have something that has the properties that I want. Um, if I had a sigmoid here, it would also work, but it's kind of doing extra work. Okay, because it would also be a valid probability distribution, but there's no point in doing that because just by, ha by having this exponential, we take care of it. So that's going to be defined as the probability of class 2 and then I'm going to have to define the probability of class 1 and class 3 just the same way. This function has a special name, it's called a soft max function. I should write it down, sir. Soft max. In the, lip, in the limit, it becomes a sort of a max. It picks the max of three. But it's sort of a smooth function in doing that. Now, how do we write a probability? We're going to write a probability the following way. So, e to the y1 divided by e to the y1 plus e to the y2 and e to the y3. This is something between zero and one and it has, and this is the probability of class 1. So when yi is 1, this is the probability of class 1. This here, remember, is the indicator function. So the indicator function, just to um, refresh your memory, we defined it as being equal to 1 when yi is equal to 0 or zero otherwise. And then this is the probability of class two and the probability of class three. If I sum the probability of class one plus the probability of class two plus the probability of class three, I get one, right? When yi is equal to 1, oh, when yi is equal to 1, sorry, that's a typo. 
Thanks, thanks for catching it. Sometimes I say something and I write a different thing. Okay? Or just to make sure that there is absolutely no confusion. If yi is class 2, the indicator of class 2 is on. So the indicator basically just tells you which, which class you're on. OK, so, and so basically this is just a long expression. It's just the same as the Bernoulli, but now for three cases. And when yi is equal to 1, then then it cannot, if yi is 1, it cannot be 2 and it cannot be 3. So these two terms here get power to the power 0. Any number to the power 0 is 1. So the only term that survives is this, which is e to the y1 divided by the, the sum of these three terms. When yi is equal to 2, only this term survives. And y, when yi is 3, only this term survives. So this expression is essentially summarizing these three cases here the probability of y being equal to 1, uh, 2, or 3. That's the likelihood. If we take the negative log, negative log, we end up again with the cross entropy. Okay, so essentially yi times the log of the yi had the predictions. And minimizing the cross entropy again gives us um, the most informative solution. Okay, so I see a few terrorized faces. <laughs> I'll stop here for questions. No? Some people here are happy. Go ahead. What do you do when you can have uh, multiple valid classes? Like if something is of three classes or a couple of ten classes? When something is three classes, uh, I didn't follow you. Like it's a human, it's a guy, and it's between 18 and 20. If those three classes out of like possible ten classes, and so can you speak up? I can't make uh, up for you. So if the classes aren't exclusive, if you can yeah. be a member, a member of multiple classes. Oh, if you can be a member of multiple classes, you could model that too. It's just you would use a different encoding. So you could quite easily um, have an encoding that allows for more than one of these neurons to fire. You would have to be careful how you normalize because you still want to have a valid probability distribution. So it's possible, but you just need to make sure that it normalizes appropriately. And that's about it. It's just a trick to construct that function. Go ahead. Uh, very good point, yes. These models are very non-identifiable. Um, for those of you who haven't come across this concept of identifiability, um, the simplest way I can say is imagine that I have this equation, 2 is equal to x times y. Can I recover x? And the answer is no, because there's multiple answers. I could say, well, it's true when you have this. It's also true when you have this, and so on. So there's multiple answers to the problem. Um, same with the neur neural net, because if we look at the picture, um, if you actually look at the, the hidden layer, if I were to swap the order of two neurons, I would get exactly the same answer. So the parameter of one neuron is indeed non-identifiable. And that causes trouble, actually. It causes trouble because when you start doing that, when a, and when an answer can, ha when, a, when a neuron could be, have two values, then you, the, the cost function then gets two peaks. There's two possible solutions. Um, and then if you have actually many neurons, you actually end up with a factorial uh, explosion 
of all the possible combinations of orders in which they could be. And so you actually have this factorial number of peaks in the likelihood. So it's no longer a nice calcium, but it's something very spiky. It, some of these modes are symmetric, in which case it's okay for learning because we just need to find one. So up to symmetry we're fine. But sometimes there's some aliasing, so they're superimposed and they create these very nasty cost functions. And optimizing neural networks is actually very hard. They were very popular in, in the 90s again uh, when I started doing research. And then they fell out of favor for other techniques. And the reason why they fell out of favor was because it was extremely hard to optimize them. Whereas there's some machine learning techniques that are convex, um, like Gaussian processes, like um, a support vector machines, which I haven't talked about yet, um, that for which it becomes possible to actually you know, solve the optimization problem. And so these very complex models were sort of abandoned until a few years ago when enough progress had been made in terms of algorithms and also, importantly, enough progress had been made in terms of GPUs and being able to store lots of data. Once we had lots of data in GPUs, which is how you typically want to code these models, then you can actually implement the gradients um, efficiently. But they are indeed very problematic. Um, there was, I think I was here. Um, what happens if we use um, a least squared cost estimate for performing binary classification? Um, you could do that. It's not my favorite thing to do. But you could use still a Gaussian. And then if something is greater than zero, you assign it to class one. So if you can do calculate the gradients of the Bernoulli model, and especially in terms of implementation, the implementation seems to die off the and Okay, so I'm gonna when I, we talk about gradients, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna go over that point that you mentioned now. So he's mentioned a very important problem with this. I'll come to it. There are solutions around it. Okay, so that's multi-class. And really all neural networks are all the same. The only thing that I'm doing here is depending on the data, whether the data is binary or multi-class or Gaussian, I'm just essentially changing the, the probability model for Y. If my data was Poisson counts, then I would use a Poisson distribution to model Y and so on. So the output of neural network would be the, more, the, the mean of a Poisson. Um, if it was gamma, the same thing. If it was an inverse Wisher distribution modeling, the same thing. So there are two components to this. There is the nonlinear approximation through combining basis functions, and then there is the choice of um, probability in the output. OK, let's come now to how we learn the neural net, how we do the training. Um, let's assume we're doing, for simplicity, I'm going to do the back propagation for the binary case, sorry, for, for regression. But if you want to do classification, um, come to office hours. Um, okay, so the technique we're going to use is called back propagation because the idea is we're going to do a forward pass through the network. So when we, when you do computing with neural networks, we always break the training in two steps. The first step is we take the input x and we feed it through the network to generate all the o's and u's and y hats. So we generate all the intermediate signals and the output signal. And then in order to adjust the parameters, we're going to go backward. We're going to go compute gradients backward. So forward pass and then backward pass. Okay. So the forward pass we already know how to do because we've seen the operations before. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, which is basically if you have an input x, that input in the forward pass, you essentially have u11 is just theta1 plus theta2x. u12 is theta4 plus theta3x. And then you squash each of these u's through a sigmoid to get the two o's. And, and then you add them up. And that gives you the output of the second layer. OK, so that's the forward pass. So now let's assume we're doing a regression. So for regression, we need to minimize the squared loss. 
In other words, yi minus yi minus the prediction yi hat uh, squared. The prediction is just this output, output 2, 1, which is the prediction of this network with parameters, with vector of parameters theta. And what's left is for us to compute the derivative with respect to any parameter. And so what we'll do is we'll compute the derivative with respect to each parameter separately. And that's going to give us a vector of derivatives. That vector has as many components as, as there are parameters. <coughs> so how do we do that? Well, this is a quadratic function. So the derivative of a quadratic function. And, and here I'm doing it for just one data, one data point. So data point at time i. I could also do it for all data points in a batch form. But let's do the online because the online is easier to get first. So the derivative of quadratic is just 2 times um, the function times the derivative of the thing that's inside, which is the derivative of yi is just 0, and then the derivative of this function. OK, first important conclusion. In order to compute the derivatives um, of neural networks, um, you will only need the derivative of uh, sorry, the derivative for any cost function, you only need the derivative for the network. In other words, the derivative for the network is this guy here. This is the derivative of the, the function implemented by the neural network, which is just a linear combination of two basis functions. And then it gets weighted by some other terms. When you do this calculation for the other probabilistic models, the cross entropy and so on, you will find the same result. So all we need is a mechanism, an efficient mechanism for computing the derivative of the network. And that's what backpropagation will give us. And backpropagation, by the way, it just means the chain rule, but with a nice graphical in, uh, interface. And so how do we compute derivatives? Um, well, 011 in the previous slide, we know that um, we know that y hat is just O to 1, which is equal to theta 5 plus theta 6 times O11 plus theta 7 times O12. Okay, so if I compute the derivative of y hat with respect to theta 5, then I just get 1, because these guys don't depend on theta 5, so the derivative is 0. With respect to theta 6, it's just 0, 1, 1. And the value of 1, 1, 1, I know it, because I first did a forward pass. And when I did a forward pass, I computed all the u's and all the o's. So, and I stored all the u's and all the o's. So, so I know this derivative, and then I know this derivative. So these derivatives are really easy to compute. For the output layer, the derivative is just basically the inputs to the last near. Okay, you can also vectorize it because of that. Um, now, if you want to compute the derivative with respect to a parameter that's further down the line, like theta 3, then um, the graph allows us to follow what we need to do. Essentially, we need to follow a path from the output to the input, and then we're going to apply the chain rule of, prob of uh, calculus. The chain rule of calculus tells us that the derivative with respect to theta 3 is just the derivative of y hat with respect to 0, 1, 2 times the derivative of 0, 1, 2 with respect to u, 1, 2, and finally the derivative of u, 1, 2 with respect to theta 3. Okay, so it's just a chain rule of calculus. You cancel the u's, the o's, and the two things are the same. But by doing this, I know that the derivative of u12, u12 is just theta 3 times x plus theta 4 times 1. So if I take the derivative of u12 with respect to theta 3, I just get x. So I just plug in x here for this guy. The derivative of output 12 with respect to u12, huh, this one is interesting. Theorem, which I recommend you prove. I, I asked this in every, uh, 340. This was in the exam, right? Okay. 
So all of you practice this. Show that if you have a sigmoid function, the derivative of a sigmoid function is just the output of the sigmoid times 1 minus the output of the sigmoid. That's another reason why we like sigmoids. There's a nice close form expression for the derivative of sigma. Okay, you can, you can show this result. So in other words, you need to show this. The derivative of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x is just equal to this. It's, just, it's three lines provided you know them. Um, and finally, we have the derivative of y hat with respect to O12. So y hat is just um, with respect to O12, which just gives you theta 7. So I plug in here theta 7. And theta 7 is the old value of theta 7. That's how I compute the derivative. And I can, by following the same procedure, I compute the derivative for any other parameter. Finally, if I do have many data points, like if I have n data points, and I only update every k step after I've seen any data, n data points, then in the batch implementation would be something like this, and where I just replace here the different derivatives for each parameter. Okay, so, and the online case, um, if I look at the derivative 4 with respect to theta 2, it would be this expression here, and then I just plug it, that's the derivative, I follow the derivative, um, I think I forgot to put a learning rate here. If you're doing gradient descent, you would typically just put a learning rate here. And, uh, and that's all there is to it. This is the equation that governs how the weights get updated. So all the time, forward pass gives you the, gives you the O's and the U's. And then you just use these expressions here to give you the derivatives. But of course, all these derivatives kind of look the same. They all have the same structure. So it's also possible to put all this in matrix form. So essentially you have a matrix, bunch of matrix multiplications forward, a bunch of matrix multiplications backward, and that's it. And then you update the weights. That's it. So in the next lecture we will see how we can then just by having un unlabeled data, we can apply the same algorithm. One exercise that I recommend you do in practice for the, f um, the final exam is try to compute the derivative with respect to each parameter in this network by hand. And in the last homework, I will ask you to do that anyway. Just make sure you practice. And then I will ask you to implement it actually in Python. One very last remark for the question that was asked at the back. So the sigmoid, one of the th problems with taking, doing this is that if you have a sigmoid, so this is actually quite important. If you have many layers, you're basically multiplying a number that's between 0 and 1 times 1 minus the number that's between 0 and 1. So with many layers, this expression goes to 0 very quickly. That's called the vanishing gradient problem and that makes it very hard to train big neural networks. Um, one of the things you can do, there's many tricks, but one of them is instead of using sigmoids, we often use the hyperbolic tangent function, tan h, which is between minus 1 and 1, or even better, we use something called rectified units, which are things that are zero, and after a certain amount of time, they start increasing as a line. Those tend to behave a bit better. Um, in the next class, I will discuss more strategies to deal with this vanishing gradient problem. Thank you.